Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Sone Lecture Series 2021-2022, themed Rule and Invention. You'll hear more about the series in a moment when you chat with our chairman, Paul Whalen. First, I'm Michael Diaz Griffith, our executive director, and I'll just give you a couple of notes about tonight's session. It will last for about an hour. Throughout the talk, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box that's accessible in the panel on your screen. Try to enter the questions in the Q&A box instead of the chat box. That way they're more visible to our speaker. At the end of the talk, there will be a brief Q&A and we'll try to address as many of your questions as possible. Um, as always, we look forward to a rich conversation and your questions are always brilliant and interesting and advance the conversation in interesting ways. So please feel free to add to the Q&A box at any time in the next hour. In the meantime, please enjoy the lecture. And before it begins, I want to cede to the floor to our wonderful chairman, Paul Whalen, who will now introduce our speaker. Paul. Thank you, Michael, and welcome everybody. Um, when we first spoke to Barry, who is a great friend to us at the Sun Foundation about speaking for this year's series on the interplay between rule and invention in architecture and the arts, he said yes, and immediately put forth the idea of discussing the great French architectural innovator, Henri Labrousse. We were thrilled with that idea, and here we are tonight. Before he starts, just a few words about Barry. Uh, Barry is uh, the Meyer Shapiro Professor of Architecture of Art History and at Columbia University, and the former chief curator in the Department of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. A specialist in the history of modern architecture, he curated numerous exhibitions at MoMA, the Canadian Center for Architecture, the Musée d'Orsay, and other venues, including Nice in Berlin, Latin America in Construction, Architecture from 1955 to 1980, Frank Lloyd Wright at 150, Unpacking the Archive, and most critically for tonight, Henri Labrust, Architecture Brought to Light, which he curated with Karine Bellier and Marc Lecoeur. That exhibition opened at MoMA in 2013. He is, he is the author most recently of Marcel Breuer, Building Global Institutions with Jonathan Massey, and many other publications, including European Architecture from 1750 to 1890. Barry is currently president of the board at the Center for Architecture here in New York. Welcome, Barry. It's wonderful to have you with us here again. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to share my screen because as always, I'm making changes until the very last minute. So um, if anyone cannot see my screen, I hope you will um, put it in the chat immediately, but um, are you seeing it, Paul? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. Good. Excellent. All right. So, yes, I was very, um, we had a wonderful conversation, Paul and I, uh, about this topic of rule versus invention. And to my mind, the absolutely key moment is the moment around 1830 in numerous locations. Sohn is part of this, but I'm not going to speak directly about Sohn tonight. Uh, but his uh, near contemporary, Henri Labrouste in Paris, is going to be our main focus, but we could equally look at architects in, in Germany in Belgium and other places. This is the key moment of the rise of romanticism in the arts. Architecture a little bit late to join that. And you'll see that my title is relative and evolutionary. So what happens once the notion of the historical past becomes not a subject of absolute standards, but a question of relative applicability of guidelines. This is the challenge that is brought around 1830 in many, many domains from law, legislation, uh, of course, historical writing itself uh, in a period of nationalism in which uh, many countries are redefining their own relationship to their own past. And that's what we see on the screen. I'm going to show it to you. I know some of you have just traveled to Italy uh, with the Sohn Foundation. Uh, and so we are going to go back there, but we're going to go back there in uh, the late 1820s with Labrousse. The drawing on the right will appear in a moment. And we're going to see how his Italian experience translated into modern buildings. Modern buildings, interestingly enough, here's La Brousse himself in a wonderful portrait now in the National Gallery in Washington, uh, commissioned from Angre uh, by his um, pupils, uh, 
Labrouste, who remained famous uh, almost uh, perpetually, while most architects of the 19th century fell into disregard with the rise of modernism. In fact, Labrousse was lionized by that great advocate for modern architecture, that great champion of Le Corbusier, of the Bauhaus, of, of Walter Gropius, Siegfried Gideon, beginning in 1928 with this publication of his book, Bauen in Frankreich, or Building in France, Building in, um, in Iron, Building in Reinforced uh, Concrete, in which he sees Labrousse Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve, which will be our major um, on-screen visit tonight, uh, a building that in fact was about a century old when Gideon announced it as the beginning of modern architecture. He then skipped over most of the rest of the 19th century uh, to get to the protagonists of the present who, who he was putting forth. In one sense, he was right. Labrousse was very interested in history and the present and with the concept that is formulated around this period of Il faut être de son temps, we must be of our own time. Uh, but I think his view of Labrousse as a proto modernist, in fact, uh, relegated the rich contemplation on the nature of tradition and this dialogue between rule and invention uh, that was central to Labrousse thinking and that of his whole uh, generation. I'll have uh, cause to speak tonight not only of Labrousse, but of his three close associates who all went off to Rome together as winners of the Grand Prix uh, from the French Academy, from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and overlapped at the Villa Medici. Some of you might have witnessed that at the top of the Spanish steps, where the winners of the Grand Prix each year were sent for a five-year study tour to Rome. We already began in the exhibition that Paul mentioned in the introduction, Henri Labrousse structure brought to light, first shown in Paris in 2012, and then brought to the Museum of Modern Art in 2013 to recalibrate our understanding of Labrousse as a much more complex uh, figure with the subtitle of structure brought to light. We'll end when we see those domes reappear, you'll know that a cocktail hour is soon appropriate, but I hope you'll have some questions before you get out your mixers. Uh, I just, those of you who hadn't seen it, these are the major episodes and just to remind you of that exhibition at MoMA. Uh, it was not to once again celebrate Labrousse as simply a proto-modernist. There are his two libraries and photographs by Candida Hofer on the title wall, but we took him for, through the entire laboratory of investigation on precisely this issue. What is the, does history tell us of both of formulating rules, but of liberating invention and of guiding invention. Invention is not free form, but invention is guided by, as we're going to see, laws of progress and laws of the application of what is learned in one place to the different characteristics of a different time and a different place. So then we took him in the exhibition to really the two great buildings. He built other things, but his, his um, work is dominated, luckily enough for him, by a reiteration of the same assignment, two times to build a library. First, the library for the rich collections of the former Abbey of Saint Genevieve, the patron saint of Paris, here evoked in that room at MoMA in 2013. And then the other, the National Library, you see the famous stacks of it uh, here in the MoMA galleries. So I need to just backtrack a little bit. Uh, I'd like to suggest that in many ways, La Brust is both the heir to and the critic of a tradition of thinking, rethinking and radical reformulation, what do rules mean in architecture? Where does architecture take his rule? The whole problem in, in terms of the period would have probably been placed more in the relationship of imitation versus invention. Uh, and the entire issue of, is architecture an imitative art like the arts of painting and sculpture in a period when no one imagined abstraction outside of representation. Uh, but if architecture is indeed an imitative art, what is it imitating? Uh, is it imitating in this sense in this famous treatise of 1753 in its illustrated second edition of 1755 by the Abbe Loger, his essay on architecture in which the muse of architecture, putting her arm, her elbow on the elements of classical architecture points to a primitive dwelling, which is growing literally from trees of nature, nature here meaning not only the laws of the botanical, if you will, but nature as reason, a higher natural reason uh, that architecture should only express what nature does, which is to have a structural function. This, of course, is a very different idea of what it means to, um, to imitate and to invent 
through a speculation on fundamental principles, a search for the fundamental starting principles of uh, making an architectural language. Um, I compare here what we might say is a other dominant mode, but one that's going to be critiqued by this, which is a much freer notion. So we have the issue here of creating the sacred house of Loreto up on the top by Bramante and below a, a Baroque version. Uh, the, both of these architects thought that they were imitating the description of the sacred heart house of um, Loreto uh, related to biblical tradition. And you see here this notion of a complete freedom as long as the, the iconographic idea uh, remained the same. Now, from the late 17th century, the French were preoccupied with defining this relationship between rule uh, and invention. And here, the reinterpretation of Vitruvius, the oldest book of architecture that we know, of course, something studied by Sohn as well, here in the famous uh, French edition by Claude Perrault, uh, with in the background, I hope you can see my arrow, the, uh, his first design for the east front or the colonnade of the Louvre trying to interpret how the classical orders of architecture as they, as they had been inherited from the Greeks and Romans uh, might be submitted to a set of proportional uh, laws which could be understood uh, and applied as a universal system of architecture, which nonetheless could be appropriate for modern France. Um, that was an important background, but in the mid 18th century, we might say two new things fed into that system and they had paradoxical results. One was, as we've just uh, briefly mentioned, Loger's uh, search to base architecture on natural laws, on a natural law of reason, uh, with this appeal to the primitive hut, with the notion that even once the structural elements of architecture became the Doric, Ionic, Corinthian columns and all of the ornaments of the classical system of architecture, they still must be applied with the rigorous notion that a column must always be carrying a, a load, a span, uh, that the architectural orders were not decoration, but they were embodiments of underlying structural laws. At the same time, uh, this is not a period of COVID, so travel became a very important element as a huge archeological revolution took place uh, famously with the publications of Stuart and Revit and of Julien David Le Roy, uh, uh, Stuart and Revit in, in Britain, Le Roy in, um, <clears throat> in France, the first to travel to Greece and to begin to give engravings of Greek monuments uh, to be studied. What should their lessons be? Uh, were these two forms to study monuments and in some ways perhaps imitate them to reason back to fundamental starting points? Were they to be compatible? Were they to be in conflict? This remains a major theme for the next really over a century of um, architecture. The building in which they are absolutely embodied most immediately is the Church of St. Genevieve, today's Pantheon, designed by the architect Soufflo and built over a more than 30 year period from the mid 1750s, so immediately after the publications that we just saw, uh, and not completed at the time of Soufflot's death in 1780. Under the French Revolution, it became the um, Pantheon transfer. This is a topic in and of itself, but as we're going to see, it is a building that is both in its theoretic grappling with the idea of rule and invention, and now the Enlightenment 18th century notion of progress that is going to be fundamentally important for La Brousse generation. And you can't see it, but just hiding around the left-hand corner of my slide is La Brousse's facade for his first great building, the Bibliothèque saint Genevieve. So we'll be coming back to this building, both as a theoretic proposition, as a challenge, but also as a neighbor uh, for the site where La Brousse will build. Uh, and here, uh, both the archeological revolution, uh, the studying of the, um, most perfect forms of the Corinthian uh, embodied inside and out, but the willingness to combine those uh, forms of antique columns with now a, uh, a very almost eviscerated vault form of great likeness, which Soufflot thought as bringing the nature of Gothic architecture together. So simultaneously studying the past, but also wanting to progress the past to such an extent that buried in the cornerstone of the church, this is a a plan to show the king where to lay the cornerstone. And this pamphlet with this engraved plate, which showed that Soufflot's plan, you see this plan here is the same as the one of the building that's about to be built, was 
part of an evolutionary sequence, hence my relative versus evolutionary in the title, an evolutionary uh, sequence of the invention and the continual progression and refinement of the Christian church type. So that Soufflot's church was both a response to uh, archaeological refinements of the orders, the search for grounding structure in reason, uh, and making sure that the columns were never applied as ornament, but always were performing their role and could be seen to be structurally rational, but at the same time, not imitating any previous church, but evolving the evolutionary chain towards a, the two cornerstones that were laid simultaneously in 1764, the new church of St. Genevieve, and the new church of the Madeleine, neither of them to be completed uh, until after the French Revolution. Here's the church of the Madeleine. So by the time, misspelled, sorry. Uh, so that by the time we actually see the church of the Madeleine finished uh, in the years around 1840, it has taken on a completely different form uh, from the beginnings of 1764 and is the utter embodiment of what we might call a Napoleonic regression. Certainly that now I'm speaking in a certain way, channeling uh, La Brousse. For La Brousse, the buildings that were being, had been completed during his youth, he was born uh, in uh, 1801. So he was born in the um, years of uh, Napoleon's rise and the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, in fact, the government, the regime of France would change an enormous number of times during his lifetime had we time to trace the history of France against this history of architecture, I think that this continual political upheaval and change itself feeds into the idea and the challenges of rule versus invention. In any case, for La Brousse and his generation, Napoleon's desire to make Paris a kind of modern imperial version of Rome uh, and to literally build almost archeological copies of Roman monuments was a perversion of the very notion of progress, of relativism, of that chain of evolution in which the past evolves towards the present and towards the uh, future. And indeed, he would be um, take up in architectural terms, a challenge that was given first by Victor Hugo, interestingly in Notre Dame de Paris, in which he says, how can we understand that the church of the Madeleine is the interior and across there it is in a contemporary view and just across the Seine, these two facades faced one another, the lower house of the uh, French parliamentary system, the chamber of deputies today, the uh, national assembly, both of them have these great Corinthian portico fronts. How do we distinguish a secular legislative building from a sacred church if everything has the uniform form of a copy of an antique temple portico, he says. And then we could go on to the stock exchange, which is chapter three of exactly the same story. There is no relativism of function. There is no uh, specificity of adapting uh, antique lessons uh, to modern uh, requirements. All of the Napoleonic buildings for this generation were a kind of arrested development of a, uh, of a grandeur that was retrospective, uh, but followed a rigid rule rather than an evolutionary rule of adaptation to modern needs. And with the church building program that was to extend uh, through the 1820s into the 1830s with the return of the monarchy, uh, the younger architects said, and look at now our neighborhoods in Paris, every one of them has a nearly identical baby version uh, of these um, Napoleonic mindlessly archeological monuments. Not that they rejected archeology, span but they wanted a much more complex lesson from it. Some hope they thought in a competition in 1824 to design the grandest public, uh, Paris church for the uh, right bank, the church of Notre Dame de Lorette, ultimately won by La Brousse's teacher, uh, the, an arch the architect Louis Hippolyte Lebas. You see it here on the screen. Uh, the competition was actually 1823. Uh, construction will continue during the time that La Brousse is away in, um, in Italy. Uh, and this church, uh, which tried to combine a antique temple front with an interior based clearly on Santa Maria Maggiore on the idea of the early Christian basilica as an evolution from ancient architecture already uh, looked back to Soufflot's Pantheon, but also looked forward to the idea of how could we develop for the 19th century, 
an architecture that takes all of the lessons of the past and puts them in an evolutionary context of becoming. So one, um, well, I, actually a pair of um, I, other figures who are going to be extremely important. Lebas is the teacher. Labrousse will ultimately both admire him, but um, as all good students do, uh, react against and in some ways reject or at least transform the lessons he had learned uh, from his studio master. Two more figures who were very prominent in the rich debates around romanticism, around what emerges uh, as historicism, the new notion that the present evolves from laws of the uh, of evolutionary change in the past. Uh, and this is the somewhat older architect, German emigre, um, uh, uh, here again depicted by Angre. This is um, Jacques Ignaz Hitorf. Uh, and Hitorf, who has gone off to uh, archaeological missions of the type that increasingly were the way one got credentials as an architect and had come back with a theory that the Greek temples were not white, they were not pure, that in fact all of the proportional systems that had been based on measuring monuments that were had lost their coloristic additions, sometimes through stucco, sometimes through encaustic, therefore not only were all proportional systems uh, that um, the mindless in, um, imitation of the Napoleonic theory it had used as justification uh, inherently false. But in fact, the Greek monuments were a riot of color in which structure was brought out by uh, a system of color uh, applied. And this caused enormous debates. So I was aware of these debates as well. They were uh, a European wide, even stretching to the new world in America, uh, the debate over whether the Greek monuments were in fact uh, painted almost carnivalistic uh, monuments of the backdrop to Greek society or whether they were in fact the austere, white, pure, neoclassical embodiments of permanent truths. Color in fact added for these uh, architects the notion that the Greeks brought the vivacity of daily life and of their institutions to think of the temple as a sort of decorated skeleton rather than a permanent embody of, of a sculptural truth. So this was um, Hittor's proposal for how the uh, temple at Selenunte on Sicily had looked originally. And soon he not only published it in the new uh, technology of chromolithographic plates in books that were going to therefore support this new vision of Greek archeology span as a vividly colored um, history, uh, but also applied it to the grandest church, even grander than Notre Dame de Lorette, the Church of Saint Vincent de Paul. Next time you're in Paris and you get off at the Gare du Nord, just a short walk away, is this building in which he used encaustic vol uh, volcanic um, lava as a backdrop to this, this encaustic coloristic depiction of the um, genesis on the church. These panels have only recently been restored to the building and it is again, the perfect vision of this polychromatic uh, revolution at the heart of the debate over architecture as something that lives and moves with its society. And again, moving into this very elaborate uh, uh, neo-Christian, uh, early Christian revival uh, temple interior uh, with a colored roof structure taken directly from um, Messina in Sicily. So combining in fact, Saracenic Byzantine Sicily with the lessons of the coloristic architecture of Sicily. The other background we need to this, and then we're going to launch into the architectural career, first the travel to Italy, and then the creation of two libraries by La Brousse, is the uh, new kind of, almost a fad, uh, the cult around the figure of San Simone, uh, who uh, had a vision that was simultaneously of a utopian future, but one that would evolve naturally from the laws of the evolution of human societies in all their dimensions. Most important for us, and I always like to make this point, is that this disciple, Barreau uh, of San Simon, began to preach right after the death, and they did call their secular lessons preaching, uh, began to preach that the future was going to be led by intellectuals. So of course, um, this is something university professors adore this theory, but none, no less did 19th century artists adore it uh, because uh, Barreau said that artists were going to be among those who were going to lead society into uh, the immediate future. 
because they possess the vision to see ahead of the common populace. So artists endowed with this leadership position of what he called the avant-garde. So if you take one thing away tonight, I hope it will be that the notion of avant-garde and classicism is not in contradiction. We are looking at the moment when they join forces and a revised vision of a classical architecture for the 19th century was thought of as the avant-garde that would begin to prepare 19th century society for all sorts of things, as we're going to see for public libraries, for the employment of new materials like industrialized cast and wrought iron uh, into um, architecture. So Henri Labousse is going to be our protagonist for the time that's left for me. Uh, these are among his teachers, Baltar. So here's Baltar doing a palace of justice. Uh, this is being designed and built as La Brust, uh, makes a uh, wins the Grand Prix with nothing less than a palace of justice. You can see here, he is a very good student of the uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He is able to apply these lessons of a monumental classicism as well uh, as a um, axial symmetric organization of space and progression towards the most important courtroom, which is nothing less than a recreation of an ancient Roman basilica out of which laws had come. So he has learned his lessons. But by the time having won the Grand Prix uh, in 1824 and therefore being sent off for five years of study in Rome, and he begins this careful copying of the um, fragments of antiquity that he can find in situ in Rome and soon beyond. But he begins to be fascinated by, as you can see in these exquisite drawings, we have hundreds of them still surviving, some of which we exhibited at MoMA in 2013. He begins to be fascinated, not simply by trying to find the underlying uh, truth of classicism to abstract it, but actually in the textures. This is the side of the Pantheon, of the portico of the Pantheon, the beginning of the rotunda, the textures of different moments in its history, of different materials, and the way in which an architecture is coming not only from the Greco-Roman orders, but also from Roman engineering, from brick structure and the like. Uh, and throughout, here's this extraordinary um, study of the Colosseum, the way in which structural laws and materials are generating form. So not classicism as a set of rules to be learned, but actually to be understood as having derived from technologies of needs, of requirements, of, of building programs, assignments uh, of uh, different periods going uh, through history. So not a question of copying the Colosseum, but of deep understanding of the Colosseum in its historical sequence. Soon his travels will, in the spirit of Hittorf before him, take him, this is the very ceiling that Hittorf uh, incorporated in some ways into Saint Vincent de Paul, uh, to Sicily. Sicily becomes an obsession because for them, it is a place that is marked by the crossroads of civilization. It shows how one culture can have an impact on another and those can be localized in forming specific relative architectures appropriate to specific moments in time, but also specific places. Uh, on the map. It's also the period where the Etruscan tombs with all of the rich wall painting and their relationship, again, of color to form is being studied. And there are hundreds of these drawings of the excitement over the debate over what was the relationship of the Etruscans to the later uh, Romans. All of this comes to a head in one of the famous controversies of 19th century architecture, and that was La Brousse's fulfillment of his homework assignment in the fourth year of his um, residency in Rome. The um, winners of the Grand Prix were expected to send back one year before they returned from Rome to Paris, proof that they could restore an entire building from its ruined state to uh, a complete monument and that this would serve as the springboard for creating new architecture. La Brousse chose the Greek temple site at Pestum south of Naples, about 100 miles south of Naples, I believe. Uh, you see it there in a stolen Getty image. There are three, at least three temples on the, uh, on the site. And he chose very ambitiously to render all three of them, to recreate them in their finished state. Here you see two of them in his uh, beautiful uh, drawings that were sent back to Paris in 1828. The topic was a little bit controversial because the Academy wondered why he would pick these rather primitive Greek monuments from this Greek colony on the south coast of Italy when there were plenty of mature Roman monuments of total splendor and they thought a greater uh, excellence. 
and therefore probably a better source for rules for the present. La Brust, however, was interested in proposing that the evolution of these buildings themselves showed how forms changed over time. So he turned the assignment into a kind of historical demonstration. It was nothing less than a manifesto about the fact that even something seemingly as fixed as the Doric order in architecture had gone through, um, had gone through an elaborate evolution. What he basically proposed was that the older theory that the most refined proportions of the Doric on the very different proportions between the different temples at Pestum was not the latest, most refined, therefore an evolution towards perfection, but was in fact the earliest because this was Greek colonists copying what they had known from Athens, from the Peloponnese, until finally they had adapted it to the local situation. He was absolutely wrong actually, but what he was trying to demonstrate uh, was a notion that architecture adapts is relative to its time and place. He even said that one of the temples was not a temple at all. This was the temple of, of Hera, no doubt about that. He restored it even with a cult figure. But this building, he said, is not a temple at all of so-called basilica because it was bisected in the center by a single row of columns. No temple would have a row of columns down the center, he said, because you would not be able to approach the great cult figure. You wouldn't have that axial address of ancient and Greek and later uh, Roman um, religion, rather, as here in his uh, perspective, interesting because the academy didn't like perspectives to render architecture, he showed the building not only bisected by a central row of columns, but to support his argument that therefore it was a secular place of civic assembly, what he called a basilica, he included graffiti and he included the shields and um, uh, swords that had been put up after a major uh, victory. Society had returned to celebrate the victory of their armies over some other uh, opponent, and they had placed their ornaments there and they decorated the temple for this occasion. For him, these are the patera of classical architecture for him. In fact, what he's beginning to argue is even what we think of as the decorative elements of the orders of architecture in antiquity came out of the interaction between societal use, between celebration, between festivals, the academy was horrified. They said, why would you restore graffiti? He said, my generation, we call ourselves now the romantics, believe that a monument is only related to its society once it begins to breathe and live with that society. We like to restore the building, not to the day it was delivered by the architect and the builders, but rather after it had spent a few years with its society, they could leave their marks, they could begin to use it, they could make it their own. So this interaction between social uses social evolution, the nature of society, and the forms of architecture become the crucible for a whole new thinking about the relationship of this archeological uh, investigation, this archeological journey, uh, and what's waiting for him in Paris, major state commissions to build the buildings that will reshape the cityscape of modern Paris. Before, he, in his private uh, notes, he makes reconstructions. This is of the upper uh, town of Agrigento in Sicily, in which he actually imagines a city, not as a perfected moment, but as a palimpsest, uh, different almost geological strata. And you'll notice, of course, color appearing quite prominently there. His brother, Pedro Labrust, a few years older, but uh, it, winning the Grand Prix afterwards, restoring here the um, temple at Cori, an Etruscan temple, and you'll notice here he shows it all decorated for a festival with these swags. I want to call your attention and just take them as one example. Let's follow those swags. You see them down here. The whole site has been decorated for a festival. The temple is a kind of scaffolding for a theatrical celebration. Uh, and La Brust Jr., Henri R. La Brust, notices that these swags then become part of sculpted stone on the base of Trajan's column so that the elements of classical ornament in architecture, they are saying, evolve from social ritualistic practices. So in his final project, a project for a design for a bridge uniting Italy and France, a kind of metaphor for how do I return to the commissions that await me in modern Paris from my studies of the long evolution of ancient architecture. Of course, even this little bridge is going to be given swags because it's a border bridge, it's a place to class between one nation, one culture, and another, based on a bridge that he had seen in provincial France, but embellished now with his new understanding. And when it fell to him, 
and a few others to design the return of the ashes of Napoleon in 1840, one of the great political acts of the July monarchy. He designed the boat that would bring those back as a kind of temple set up with these kinds of garlands. Uh, here it is, progress into Paris, the chariot that will take it to the Ambalide, uh, and even imagining redoing the bridge of the Concorde, the Pont de la Concorde, between our friends, the Chamber of Deputies and the Madeleine. He imagined the ornaments of a modern Paris with the first gas lighting, uh, the first need to create a modern gas lantern for street lighting as a kind of permanent street parade, celebrating the fact of the passage of this political act over the bridge. Uh, when he designs a, um, a uh, frontispiece for a new architectural periodical, he imagines that architecture is at once an art and a science, but both of them hold together all of the forms through historically the diverse forms through which architecture and the modern city has evolved. So let us finally come to our first of two protagonists. We're going to need quick move to move to a little bit quickly, although this is a building that I would love to give you a 10 part series on this building alone. Uh, it is a building of enormous importance admired almost immediately. This is the first, the earliest known photograph that we know of a brand new building uh, in France. It's a photograph of the Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve taken just shortly before it opened in 1850. Uh, and, but I put it here so that you can see the way these swags are going to ornament the facade, even as La Brousse subordinates the classical columns, not to their full bodied expression, but to a very severe structural expression of a kind of arcade on the upper floor, which you'll see in a moment is the reading room, and the complete absence of the classical orders from this lower base, which is the working part of the library that supports this great open reading room. But because this building and this building over here are also part of the complex, the garlands that are draped along the facade, in fact, draped along metal supports, we'll see that in a moment, continue over to the subsidiary buildings to form a complex there. So a kind of translation of this observation into the definition of a language for something that hardly ever had been a challenge for an architect up to this point, create a public library. The idea of a public library for all readers, in this case, all students of the Latin Quarter was itself a new assignment. Labrousse, before he got that assignment, worked as the assistant architect on site for his friend, one of the other romantics, Félix Dubon, who had done nothing less than to redesign the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. There he had uh, inherited, here you see it on this uh, kind of aerial pictorial map of about 1840, uh, inherited this site, the former convent of the Petits Augustins, which during the Napoleonic period had been the Museum of French Monuments of Alexandre Lenoir. So a key place that had been already a notion that this reused medieval cloister could provide history lessons in a museum that was closed by the conservative forces that wanted to get rid of all evidence of medieval uh, art as something that might inspire modernity to return to a Napoleonically correct, let's say, uh, strict classicism. Uh, but many things had been moved, fragments from chateaux, fragments from churches under the revolution and the revolutionary violence, including this whole section of the chateau at Gaillon, a transitional building from the late medieval to, as you can see, some of the earliest French Renaissance elements. Uh, this was a proposal uh, by an architect of the period to build a brand new building there uh, and to demolish the uh, historical fabric. But instead, what took place is that the school was inserted into this monastery and a battle set place took, uh, began to take form between the old guard who wanted that any uh, design of the buildings would reinforce the notion that it was the goal of modern French architecture to rival the perfection of ancient Greece and Rome. And now this emerging romantic set who said no, all of the history, including our own history, is something that we need to learn from in an evolutive, in a relative fashion. And so increasingly we find that uh, instead of a brand new a style or classical um, a building with a perfect classical portico, uh, the first architectural design by the architect de Bray, who was going to be succeeded by Dubon, 
begins to imagine the opening as a triumphal arch through which the artist will enter into the palace of studies. Uh, but ultimately this is redesigned by Dubon in which the triumphal arch becomes incorporated into the system of architecture itself, something he observed from the evolution of the triumphal arch into the motifs of Renaissance architecture to create a frontispiece, a heightening of the center of the building. But here's the great controversy. So if you go today, uh, this is what you will see. But in fact, this is not at all what Dubon intended. And this is not at all what artists and architects saw before 1968. Rather, they saw this, the frontispiece of the Chateau at Gaillon, uh, juxtaposed over um, Dubon's triumphal arch frontispiece entry with the Chateau of Annette by Philibert de Lorme. And over here, he wants a Gothic piece, a kind of history lesson, how Gothic and classicism could be incorporated into a synthetic architecture that was uniquely French, and it could serve as the point of departure for the same motif, but reinterpreted in modern terms behind by uh, Dubon. So he wanted the entire progress of the students through these fragments to be a kind of walking history lesson. Catherine de Quincy, who was the uh, really the rule maker in the academy said, this is terrible. We can't have the students see all these things that are bad taste. They're going to long the wrong, learn the wrong lessons. Dubon said, no, they're going to be sophisticated enough. They're going to understand the historical progression. They're not going to copy anything they see. They're going to see the logic that moves through all of it. And they're going to be inspired by that logic to continue the trajectory into modern invention, just as I have in the way that my building evolves from this courtyard of fragments, taking us through into the building and through these layers of historical time, just as he admired in these fantasies about ancient Pompeii, as the students progress into the building, through the outdoor museum to the room in which they will copy and study from antique fragments, but also natural elements in order ultimately to be able to create their own compositions. So I'm gonna move very quickly here, this is the prize ceremony, because it is out of that whole argument between what we might call eternal values and relative values that had taken place just maybe a mile away at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, that Labrouste will emerge to make his synthetic statement. I think you can see there's some relationship between the architecture of the Palace of Studies at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts by Dubon, and now Labrouste designing here in a view I took from the uh, roof of the old Abbey of St. Genevieve, a new building to house the books that had been since the Middle Ages in the medieval Abbey of St. Genevieve, which had been secularized during the French Revolution. So uh, there, this site, this, if we had just a little bit more um, of a photograph here, the Pantheon side elevation is right there. So now he's also going to return to the site where Soufflo had grappled with the relationship between archeology span and a progressive evolutionary view uh, of the movement of classicism into the present. For Soufflo, it was to bring it into the time of Louis XV. For Labrouste, it will ultimately to bring it into the constitutional monarchy of King Louis Philippe uh, almost a century later. Here's our aerial view. This is uh, Labrouste Library. Soufflot's church. So a fascinating dialogue between the two. And there you see part of the reason why he has these uh, flattened columns, more like pilasters, but they're absolutely structural for the great open cage, the great open room of the reading room, which occupies the entire upper floor of this building, is because his building will be seen behind deferential to the former church, deferential to the school of law, the library as a more service building, a background building, forming the northern edge of this great square, but taking up motifs from the 18th century architecture and continuing it into the 19th century architecture. One of the great innovations here, we're going to see when we go inside, is the opening up of space through the availability of much more performative um, structural cast iron that will form the inner structure of the entire uh, upper room, the reading room of the library, but which is also going to be supported by a complex integration of iron into masonry, uh, which is going to pop out. These are the ends of the cross beams in iron that stick out there to pin the interior iron skeleton to the masonry envelope. And on that, Labrouste has hung these garlands. And those garlands, in fact, 
pick up from Garland's, you can see here, right across the street. So there's our photograph uh, here, the long facade, uh, and let us begin to understand the building the way La Brousse did, not only as a evolution from the entire history of architecture, but a building that is responding very specifically to the French Renaissance in the church here of saint Etienne du Mont, to the enlightenment of Soufflau, uh, to the entire context of the specific relative Parisian French uh, context. Now, clearly he had learned from all of his Italian studies, look at this, and then look at this as we enter into the building, that incredible uh, appropriation of refinements of masonry as we move up towards the orders uh, in this um, ancient tomb that he had studied and drew. The building is an absolutely uh, a synthetic absorber of almost everything that he has seen and thought about, but not by copying individual details, but by bringing it into a great concept of what would be a publicly accessible library in the early 19th century, something that had no precedent. The library had been inside the abbey before. It wasn't a freestanding building. Uh, he's going to take that up in many ways, not the least putting the names, as we'll see in a moment, of the authors in the card catalog of the library to fill in these infill walls, which are the back of the bookcases in the reading room. Look now, though, here is the key element, and this takes us right back to his drawing of the Colosseum, uh, how he shows this very thin masonry now made possible by the fact that much of the interior is metallic uh, and how we can read every element of the interior spaces of the interior structure on the exterior. It's as though uh, we are literally looking at the bones of the building uh, through a very light veil of skin. Notice the use of color, red here, to bring out the names of the authors uh, and to bring out certain elements of the decor. And we already therefore get a preparation for one of the most extraordinary rooms of the 19th century, La Brousse Great Reading Room, which occupies the entire uh, upper floor of this long longitudinal box. And guess what? Bifurcated in the middle, not only by bookcases that allow the readers here not to be bothered by what's going on over there, but also by very thin attenuated um, cast iron columns, which take the proportions not of something studied in an ancient monument where one would never find a cast iron column, but rather from the structural capacity of this much thinner uh, um, form that comes from the nature of iron. So a dialogue between the tradition of classicism and the bringing of it into the industrial present by this great celebration of this canopy almost floating over the space of a cast iron a structure on which uh, these encaustic, slightly reflective uh, white infill of vault is placed, this double barrel vault, in order to make the ceiling into a great reflector of all of the light coming from all four sides to cast light down uh, on the reading surface, creating what he calls a shadowless light. Although this was the one of the first public buildings in France to incorporate at night gas lighting to try to keep the students out of the cafes and the bars and to keep them at work at their reading tables. So this idea, here we see the iron structure pulling out, being given the form of the stamp that is the librarians put in every single book on an every single form. This is the seal of the library of Saint Genevieve. So the function of the building and the structure of the building coming together, even in the smallest details, to invent something absolutely new on which this permanent lush garland uh, has been uh, draped. And then of course, in letters, the name of the library, just as above the names of the authors in the books. So let's just uh, repeat the progression in. We're going to come into this lobby. La Brousse said he would have liked people to be able to move through a garden, but the space was too tight. So he had an illusionistic garden created. And he already shows off the iron structure almost as though it's a garden trellis, but it's also supporting the heavy weight of the books on the floor above. We're going to pass through a kind of pantheon of great figures in the history of making books and of thought. And we're going to then come to this well of light, which is the staircase behind, passing under a bridge, almost as though the bridge he had redesigned on the uh, Pont de la Concorde was now coming in as a staircase element. We pass under the bridge up above, past this gas lighting, and then emerge into this great reading room. Now I'm almost using up my time, but I'm going to take you here, this beautiful 
uh, final drawing that Labos does in which all the books are in place, so the author's names on the other side. Uh, and in fact, the entire room is formed by books and by tables and by the activity of reading individually in a great public assembly. But the bifurcation of the room down the center, which is not actually structurally necessary, this as you can see space can be spanned without this intermediary columns, was also a symbolic notion that great civic spaces of the past, whether it be the refectory of the medieval monastery, here the room restored by Dubon at the Chateau at Blois where the Estates General had met in the Middle Ages. Uh, so civic assembly, politically, civic assembly, even the reading, uh, that took place in the communal eating space of the monks. Um, all of this then comes into the bifurcated space, which is none other than a recreation in modern iron public library terms of the Basilica at Pestum. So the direct response, not copying the Basilica at Pestum, but the idea of that civic space of bifurcation. You might have noticed as we move from that to that, that unfortunately in the 1960s, the orientation of the tables was changed, the central uh, book stacks came down. And this incredibly beautiful ironwork in which Labrousse invents a new ornamental form for the new material inside the crucible of this consideration of how the uh, observing rules through history can lead to the invention of the present and the immediate future. So the last assignment, and you'll give me just a few moments to give you some of the splendors of Lavoux's second assignment, nothing like being given another library to do in which he can think of theme and variation. In this case, it is the National Library. It is not a new building. It is to rework uh, parts of an existing complex structure of several um, French uh, aristocratic residences, hotel that had been uh, put together. Those of you know the Boulet drawing, which was an inspiration, of course, for La Brousse Bibliothèque Saint Geneviève, but this is Boulet in the 1780s, imagining creating a public library in this space here. Uh, so La Brousse will get that task, but he'll keep an open courtyard. He's going to bring us in from a little garden in. We're going to turn right and go into the great reading room. And then we're going to have the complex problem of housing the incredibly huge book collection of the National Library behind. So here's our plan. You can see the reading room, which you're going to see, and its connection to the book stacks. Now, this being a deposit library, one copy of everything printed in France must be sent to the National Library to this day. The um, stacks have to be separated from the place of reading. So a different problem there. Here's the um, urban envelope, La Brousse inventing kind of background architecture for what then emerges with this now very uh, complicated reflection on all sorts of elements of the history of architecture from the Etruscans through the great bath windows of the Romans through the metallic, uh, the med medallion uh, frieze of a Renaissance palace, all brought together to create a monument that is a synthesis of the um, history of architecture, including elements from this building here which is an 18th century building, which he brings that vocabulary across, mixing all these elements to create an architecture of what he would think of as a progressive syncretic or synthetic architecture for the, uh, for the present. He liked the fact that historically rooms had often been draped uh, when they were used for honorific purposes. So we're going to go through a permanently draped vestibule and then emerge into really this incredible space in which now, a nine square uh, grid of uh, almost um, oval domes uh, held aloft by four freestanding, incredibly attenuated uh, ionic columns in cast iron, and then their wall equivalents around the perimeter will create a reading room that is interrupted structurally only by four point supports in this vast space with these oculi of natural light coming across these uh, ceramic diffusers to create a great reading room, the height necessary in order to turn the whole room into a, a diffuser of light. But most extraordinary, the classical column, and we can almost end here, pulled almost like a kind of Gumby to its uh, total extension. Is it classical? Is it Gothic? Is it 19th century cast iron finding its um, expression? Is the, are these vaults, being held up or are they being somehow tied down 
by these various forms of a room lined with books, but then with a, we're going to see in a moment, a view very dramatically into the totally iron factory-like stacks where the books are held. One little detail, because we can always take Labouze down to the detail, he turns the volutes of his cast iron ionic column at 45 degrees so that they can receive these truss vaults as though they were the medieval ribs of a Gothic vault, or is it a train shed? So it is at once a classical basilica, a medieval vaulted hall, and a kind of train shed for reading, all brought together into this incredibly serene space where I had the privilege of working for many years and which is now the National Institute of Art History, with finally the dramatic willingness to have these two caryatids flank not the entrance to a temple with some monumental sculpture of a deity, but rather for the rational scientific 19th century, a view into these incredibly functional cast iron stacks with skylighting and a system for the quick retrieval of books from this vast magazine or depository. Ah, there are our garlands again at the end wall. Uh, and then the view back for those fetching the books into the reading room where they were going. And I just end with what would need a whole nother lecture, the extraordinary reconfiguration of the Ile Cité, partly by what you see in the foreground, the reworking of the palace into the court system, the central courts, the highest courts of France for the Palais de Justice, by a third of the four romantic architects here, Louis Duc. And as it was mentioned in the text that announcing this lecture, Louis Duc, at the end of his life, leaving part of his fortune for the creation of the Prix Duc, the Duc Prize at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which recognizes the finest invention of something new from the traditions of the past. So finally incorporating into the very structures of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, this evaluative relative notion of the relationship between rule and invention. So I'll end there on the Ile Cité uh, with, of course, Notre Dame in the background. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Barry. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, I, have to think, I have to say, sometimes I think of the 19th century, uh, 19th century architecture as, as sort of, I'm always think, I think of the stuff that I dislike. That because there was so much construction in the 19th century that was sort of prefabricated and and I forget the brilliance that came out of the 19th century, which you reminded me of tonight. And I have to say the Bibliothèque Saint Geneviève has always been one of my favorite buildings, but I must not have been listening very carefully when it was described to me, and I don't remember at all the brilliant uh, uh, detail of the uh, of the iron beams coming through and being expressed on the outside. Thank you so much for that uh, reminder. Uh, how, how clever on so many levels that building is. Um, Michael, do we want to take a couple of questions? But frankly, I could I could discuss this for a couple of hours, but we but we do have to get to the cocktails that everybody else seems to want. So, um, Michael, are there any questions we want to take? Yes, we have a we have a Sonian question to kick things off. Conrad asks: Is there a similar special relation spatial relationship and understanding of space? between Soane's Bank of England and the National Library? Um, uh, yes, I wouldn't say it's a direct uh, conversation, uh, you know, one influencing, uh, well, one influencing the other would of course need to go from Soane uh, exactly. to La Brousse for the, um, for the dates here. But I think there's that same spirit of um, a, first of all, re technology rethinking the, the dome, the, the vaults and the domes of the Bank of England are this fascinating study in, um, in fireproof construction, much of it done with kind of hollow uh, tile forms. This has antecedents, of course, in the, in the Romans, but he is uh, inventing not only technologically, um, because it was as important for Soane to create a fireproof situation for the banknotes of the Bank of England as it was for La Brousse to create it for the uh, literary heritage of, the, of French civilization. Uh, but also Soane is thinking of these forms in which he can rethink the vault, this kind of continuity between the pendentive and the vault that you often see in many of the um, transfer halls of the, the banking halls of the, uh, of the Bank of England, I think are spiritually very connected to La Brousse. We know that La Brousse traveled to, um, to England. 
we know that he was aware of the evolution of the British Library and the mm -hmm. great reading room there. Uh, we also know that the uh, advice for the librarians of the cataloging systems that were being created and the storage systems at the British Museum were of interest to the Bibliothèque Nationale. So there is a Franco-Anglo um, exchange going on there, um, but we don't have any record of Laboust actually visiting Stone or making comments on Stone. Um, I think it's when, I think the Bank of England is, Conrad is absolutely right. That is where one sees it the most. Um, I think that the, um, for, for La Brousse, what is behind um, Michael's head here would just be a little bit too uh, cluttered and poetic. It would not have the underlying <laughs> laws of the evolution of history and form uh, that, the French, that this French generation was, uh, was after. So to follow up on that, I think we'll have a couple of questions that look forward to the later 19th century into the 20th century. But before that, Barry, um, Michael is asking, was La Brust uh, the first person to call uh, the first temple of, of Hera at Pestum a basilica, quote unquote? And um, others are, have asked, would you please comment on whether La Brust was influenced by Ottoman architecture? So there's sort of questions about precedent. And yes. Um, so no, the basilica was, it was frequently referred to as a basilica. So I, we already have um, Piranesi referring to it, I believe, I'd have to double check that as a basilica. Still, it was thought to be, it was thought to be a temple and it was given they were, their, their temple ABC uh, and, and there are minor temples there as well. So it's not so much the name as the insistence on the function and the insistence that it's not a temple at all, that it's not a religious building, that it's a civic building, uh, which comes with, which comes with La Brousse. Um, so if anyone is interested, there's a wonderful book by uh, Sigrid de Jong, so she's Dutch, it's, the book is in English, uh, on pre pre precisely on the history of these interpretations of Pestum. Mm -hmm. um, very different question. The, um, the uh, was La Brousse. This is one that comes up over and over again. People have been intrigued. Uh, some historians, uh, David Van Zanten for one, uh, feel very strongly that images of, um, of Hagia Sophia uh, feature into uh, in de La Brousse. Others see uh, mosque structures. Mm. Uh, and of course, this is after the uh, French conquest of Algeria in 1830. So these connections to the south coast of the Mediterranean are very strong between eight, from 1830 on. Um, but um, I think it's such a, how should I say, it's such a crucible for the mixing of things to come up with a, a kind of new alloy uh, that uh, it would be, I think it would be reductive or uh, not getting the spirit of La Bousse to look for a single source to say, if we see this one, that displaces the others. In fact, uh, the, all of them, I think, have been absorbed there. Uh, but that Byzantine, that the sort of Ottoman Hagia Sophia mosque feeling is very, very strong. Uh, not the least in the, um, one of the big differences between the two libraries is uh, a kind of weakening of any sense of directionality of space as we move into the, um, uh, and there, you know, kind of like this Cordoba thing where uh, space is moving diagonally in a, in many, many different directions because the structure is so minimalized in those four central columns. One more question about uh, the 19th century. David uh, says there are some parallels between Violet the Duke and his theories and Le Brousse's. Is there a di direct relationship between their theories of uh, evolution or relativism in the context of architecture? And even I would say between the, the details of the, the kind of sketches that Viola Leduc created that to me remind me so much of, mm -hmm. of the actual the structures that Labrust uh, built. Yeah, so well, that's a, um, it, that, that'd be four part seminar to answer that question. Because it's a <laughs> very, complex, it's a very complex relationship between the slightly younger Viola Duke who had refused to go to the academy, but very much admires these figures. So it was Viola Duke who referred to La Brousse's drawings of Pestum as a revolution on a couple of uh, large, what are called elephant folio sheets, because they're very large 
the largest piece, single piece of paper you could buy for drawing in the 19th century, what they call uh, elephant folio or grand aigle. Uh, and Villet du admiration for La Brousse. This he says it in the 1870s. He says Villet, uh, uh, La Brousse drawings in 1828 were nothing short of a revolution on a couple of sheets of elephant folio paper. Uh, so this notion, uh, I think that Villet Duc would answer the question by saying, I admire um, La Brousse and his friends enormously. However, we are French, we invented Gothic architecture and the expression for this uh, is already at a place on our shores. There's no need to bring in all of this material from the south of the Alps. Uh, we have our own national architecture and I agree with you ideologically, but I don't agree with your, your, your sort of points of reference for coming up with uh, the starting point for your, uh, for your evolution. Um, but they sat together on many committees. They talked to one another. Um, they are, um, I suppose you could say that they're a bit like the Democratic Party right now. They can't quite get to the same place because they're factionalized. So speaking of, of factionalism, uh, we have a question about uh, relationships between Greek and Roman uh, idioms. So Michael Goldblum asks, how does the integration of Greek stylistic elements and sensibilities relate to your reading of Labrust as one seeking for a romantic recognition of modernity? Also, does the Roman attenuated columns seen in wall paintings, or do the Roman attenuated columns seen in wall paintings figure as a precedent for iron columns in the 19th century? The answer to the second part of the question is really easy, yes. <laughs> Uh, and um, I think there's also the way in which La Brust is, is interested in these atmospheric effects. So it's as though he's trying to build three-dimensionally what it would be like to live in a Pompeian wall painting. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's absolutely um, on the mark and very um, perceptive to feel that even in these bad PowerPoint slides, probably on the screen as small as the one I'm talking to you from. I'm not 100% sure I understood the first part of the question about Greek versus Roman and Romanticism. Yeah, I, th I think that um, Michael may be asking, we don't want to sort of put words into his mouth, but sort of how the, you were, you were showing us these examples of Napoleonic architecture, which drew heavily from Greek precedent, right? The Roman, and, and, and Roman. Roman, yeah. How, how does the integration of Greek stylistic elements in Labrust's time relate to a reading as, of him as, as seeking a romantic recognition? And maybe you could talk a bit about how this idea of, of animating, uh, of the sort of animation of architectural idioms with the garland, et cetera, figures with within the context of the Greek idioms that they sort of yeah. overlay. Uh, yeah, so the, um, so this too is a, needs a kind of, you know, 10 part seminar series on this issue. But um, so the complex issue of the Greeks versus the Romans or the Greeks and the Romans is essentially, you could take that as a, a lens through which to look at most of the prominent debates uh, from about 1750 uh, to at least 1870. Uh, and they have much to do with whether or not the Romans were the absolute inheritors of the Greeks and you're looking at one unified body uh, of Greco-Roman civilization or whether, and this is why, this is why Labos picks a Greek monument on, on Italic soil, or whether even though the classical language of architecture is passed on these are two independent cultures with a complex relationship to one another, and one must distinguish between Greek and Roman architecture. So the standard view had been before the middle of the 18th century that yes, of course, Greek, the Greek, Greek architecture was, as Winkelmann would say, the most, you know, absolutely the superior form of architecture, but the Romans inherited it from the Greeks. So you didn't really need to bother with Greek architecture because you got all of the laws and all of the forms in Roman architecture. There was one great body and anywhere you looked at it, you were going to ultimately get to the eternal truth of Greco-Roman classicism. What begins to happen in the 18th century, which is why I wanted to have a little prelude on Soufflot and Mm. of Saint Genevieve, 
is a controversy over the Greeks versus the Romans. Uh, and this is going to be a historical, ideological, aesthetic, architectural problem for at least 100 years. Uh, whether you think that there is one coherent body of Greco-Roman architecture or whether you need to historically situate Greek and eventually Etruscan and Roman architecture as discrete, interrelated um, aesthetic systems, but which are also relative to their own time and their own place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that moreover, early Greek versus later Greek, et cetera, these kinds of so this has, you know, this is the sort of background to everything that I've been trying to present to you tonight, which is the, uh, we might call it the revolution for the, uh, in a search for relative historical values rather than eternal classical truths. A final question from me, Barry, that syncs up with that. And then Paul, I'll hand it over to you. I'm synthesizing a couple of different questions and maybe requesting a preview, Barry, of your next lecture for us. Oh. You've, you've given us this wonderful <laughs> genealogy up to Labrust and, in, and including some of his peers and predecessors. If you were to, to take this lecture onward into the 20th century, who would be the others you would, would plot in this history of the evolution of a, a relativistic view of architectural history? Um, who, who are the next protagonists in this story that we might look forward to hearing about in your future lectures? Well, I think, you know, I could give you the whole line, some of them more obscure than others in the, um, uh, one problem is of course the La Brousse is uh, overshadowing an incredible generation of inventive people here. Louis Duke is a figure who really should be studied and is uh, very understudied. We don't yet, I even have a monograph on him, the Palais de Justice in Paris, a very complex monument, but it's incredibly, um, I wish we had time to uh, look at the great room there. Um, but we would we could go on to a series of, of today lesser known figures, uh, Gade, Andre, Pascal in in uh, in uh, French terms. But I would take it, of course, uh, through Charles Garnier to Auguste Perret and even to Le Corbusier. Wonderful, and you'll be invited back in five <laughs> minutes to give us that lecture. <laughs> Great. Well. Uh, Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Michael. Um, so, um, Barry, I, I would love it if you could put in your, uh, save the date in your calendar, and also this goes out to everybody else who's listening to us tonight, of um, on December 7th, where we're gonna have our holiday party at the Union Club, uh, following a lecture by Martin Filler. And uh, Michael is gonna be sending out an invitation to this, and you can, you'll be able to check it out in a day or two on our website, which apparently crashed for a couple of days, but is, is back up again. Uh, so just put it on your calendars and then look for more information and we'd love to see as many of you there as possible. And uh, Barry, thank you so much for, an, for another amazing lecture. And uh, I'll be thinking about all this as I get on a plane in five minutes because times have changed and we're, we're traveling again. Bon voyage. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everyone.